Well, when I was a little boy sitting on my mama's knee. Hello, welcome to Going Deeper. My name is Marcy Sclove, and today my guest is Penny Gill. Penny is a retired professor, the Mary Lyon professor from Mount Holyoke College, and was also a dean there working with students for over 40, well, around 46 years. Yeah. yeah. In the last few years, Penny has begun receiving teachings um, from a Tibetan master whose name is Manjushri. And she has written a book called What in the World is Going On? basically, of these teachings. Uh, Penny has homes here in Granby, Massachusetts, and also in Madison, in uh, Mer Madeline, Madeline Island, Island. <laughs> Madeline Island, Wisconsin. Good. Thank you. Well, we got through the introduction. <laughs> now we can have some fun. Right. Welcome. Uh, really thank glad you. I'm here. delighted to do this with you, Marcy. Yeah. 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 So, <clears throat> Okay, you're a professor for 46 years teaching political science. You have your degree in that from Yale University, one of the highly renowned schools in the country. You are certainly not a flake. <laughs> no, I'm not a flake. No flake. <laughs> so in our culture, the experiences you've had and how these teachings came to you um, aren't as common or easily accepted. And I wanted to start by just having you explain, like, how did this happen and what is it like? What's going on? Oh, well, those are wonderful questions. And, and you know, to start out, it's very mysterious to me. I don't, I don't feel confident that I can name exactly what's happening or what the implications are or what it tells us about reality. Mm -hmm. I have some ideas, but I have yeah. no way of taking that up in a kind of firm conceptual system. So first of all, okay. I find it fascinating. I was yeah. pretty overwhelmed. The academy, the academic world, is astonishingly hostile mm -hmm. to anything that can't be shared between two people, what the academic scientists call intersubjective hmm. reproducibility. In other words, I have an experience, I show it to you, <clears throat> and another person can then reproduce that. Okay. Not possible. Right. But right. the basic premise of science, and we live in a highly scientized mm -hmm. society, is that things can be measured, things can be counted, things are out there visible to multiple observers mm -hmm. if they're properly trained. And that that visible shared reality is what we need to understand. Right. So that's okay as far as sure. it goes. But from that, that world, that cultural view mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. decides that anything that isn't vulnerable to that kind of observation and measurement doesn't exist. Right. There is no category of interesting phenomena that we can't observe and count. They have let that go. Yeah. And so in a funny way, the most important thing that science does is to make an assumption mm -hmm. that they fail to examine and fail to test. So mm. that's the big picture. So it's, I have this one life where I teach European politics right. and comparative politics and Hannah Arendt and Marx and wow. globalization and all those good things. Yeah. And then <clears throat> on this other side, it turned out that there, I, I was allowed some access to a different kind of knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I, when, <coughs> excuse me, valley bug. <laughs> it's okay. When this came, yeah. and I didn't know what to do with it, um, I decided I was just going to open to it. And if I can just give you a little paragraph about sure. how this started, because oh, it was please. so bizarre. Yeah. So Madeline Island is a little island out in Lake Superior, and it's remote, and it's beautiful. And mm. I've gone out there for my summers for many, many years, 
and I got out there about, I don't know, maybe eight or ten years ago, and I had just finished teaching a course on radical ecology, which is tremendously scary and stuff about what's going on in the world. Um, the United States had just invaded uh, another country in the global south. Uh, yeah. The level of violence in the world just seemed to me to be escalating, and the United States seemed just bizarrely disinterested in conflict resolution. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just a wreck. I'm a journal writer. I got to the island I'm writing every morning, trying to get all this crud out of my system yeah. so that I can kayak and go for walks and enjoy my island friends and have my island life. <clears throat> Three or four mornings, I'm just dumping and dumping, and nothing is happening. And then all of a sudden, exactly like that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, the voice said, an internal voice, not a voice that you mm -hmm. and I could hear at the same time, mm -hmm. but an internal voice said, that's not how we see it. And I kind of freaked out and yeah. put my journal down and immediately went out for a walk. And the yeah. same thing happened the second morning and the third morning. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to get up and go for a walk. I'm going to sit here with it and see what happens. And I said, well, tell me what you mean by that. And this is the consequence yeah, of here's opening the book. to that. What in the world is going on? So it turned out that there was, that this um, collection of teachings, which is what it is, is an extraordinarily interesting reframing mm -hmm. of my anger with the world and my frustration and my heartbreak and my mm -hmm. sorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Yeah. And so the enormous power of a reframing yeah. is that then you can act. Right. It opens up space for action. It opens up space, and even maybe more importantly, for compassion. Yeah. Kindness. So can you tell us a little bit about what it is that's getting reframed and then how the reframing sounds Ooh, and sits. Right. It's a big, you that, know, yeah, well, that's, that's the fabulous, nugget. Yeah, in that, a way. it's the nugget, and it's a fabulous question. So, in a sentence, me as a social scientist, mm -hmm. as a, somebody interested in global politics and globalization, yeah. I saw a system that was almost exclusively oppressive to people who had no choice about whether they were going to participate in it or not. Yeah. And what the reframing does is to say, yes, there's very harmful things going on, yeah. but it is also a gigantic opportunity. And so the teacher took my understanding of globalization and shifted it to an understanding about interdependence. Oh, wow. So that I could see that the, underneath the WHO and global trade agreements and, you know, global corporations and all that stuff that right. I was objecting to, right. underneath that are many, many, many layers of connectivity, mm -hmm. which we can learn how to use, that we can learn how to shift our understanding about what is primary and what is secondary. Yeah. So that, that, in a sentence, that's, that's the reason. Can you give an example of what you mean by what's primary and secondary? Is this like on an energetic level or? Could be. Mm -hmm. You're good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Um, well, I th that would be one way to go, but under, underneath that, there's another yeah. pair. Okay. Yeah. And that is physical force, mm -hmm. political force, military force, yeah. economic force, those kinds of things, as opposed to what I think we should probably call the force of spirit, mm. the force of intention, the power of um, solidarity, the mm -hmm. power of making connection. And so it doesn't, it doesn't say this, this I love the title of your show. 
It doesn't say that the surface, what we see on the surface is, doesn't exist. Yeah. But it says there's a powerful energetic reality underneath it. Yeah. Deeper. Yeah, going deeper. <laughs> that yeah. we are rooted in and that we can access and that we can use. And at that level of spirit of heart connection yeah. of you know we can use the buddhist language of karma and all of you know all that apparatus all yeah. that buddhist apparatus yeah. you can use all of that to understand what the connectivity is but for those of us in the states who aren't mm -hmm. literate buddhists most of us right. just talking about the world of spirit and the energy that's available seems to be enough to open the door a little bit and start talking about fear and and conflict and those kinds of things. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so in your book, uh, fear is really the biggest yeah. obstacle yeah. to everything. Yeah. And the description of what fear does in the body, I found that amazing. Mm -hmm. Like it's so true how you know, the, the, the it, it's about energy going more dense, mm -hmm. and that the density then makes it more difficult to thrive yeah. in your body and in society, et cetera, et yes. cetera. So, so tell us a little more about fear and and where you want to go well, with let's that. Look at, let's look at fear and ego, okay. because that's mm -hmm. of closed loop that is, I think, probably the basic argument of, of the yeah. teachers. Yeah. And <clears throat> this is not an anti-ego argument. Sure. But if ego... So wait, first okay. define what you mean by ego. Um, is that... I don't mean Freud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think what the teachers mean by ego is, is this conscious personality and identity that we okay. live with and recognize and protect and take care of. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. so. It's it's not a negative concept. What is what is harmful to us? The teachers say yeah. is when we think when we allow that sense of self, which is a constructed sense of self. Sure. When we allow that to run the whole show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Manjushri makes the argument over and over again that that ego self, little self he likes to call it yeah. when he's getting really irritated, <laughs> that little self mm -hmm. trying to support its safety and security generates fear yeah. because then we poor human being um, will engage in all kinds of behaviors that end up that look like they're going to support our safety and security, right. but don't. What they do is cut us off yeah. from each other and from, and from meaning. Yeah. yeah. And when we're cut off from meaning, as you say, we don't thrive. Yeah. In fact, we get sick and miserable and cranky and right. mentally ill and lots of Lots sure. of things we don't want to be. Sure, sure. So the real, the real task for each of us is to learn how to handle fear constructively and not feed it, not yeah. feed our fears, and to recognize when we are creating storylines, yeah. narratives about fear that are entirely fictional. Right. So that's, that's a great segue because I love the part about fear that is legitimate in, in nature mm -hmm. versus fear that is imagined. Yeah. I love that part too. And that's the most powerful thing for most readers. <coughs> um, he argues that there are two kinds of fears, you say exactly mm -hmm. correctly. And one he, you know, kind of mockingly calls the tiger in the grass, and you were wired to take care of ourselves in the moment, and and we, that's a gift, that's an instinct, it's a gift. We share it with every living being, and we do not want to undo that right. mechanism, right. and we can't, so it's okay. The fears that he's concerned about the most, and that he thinks inhibits our ability to create community and create 
peaceful lives with each other are the fears that we've imagined. And he says, you know, it's, only humans have imagination, and it's mm -hmm. our great gift. But the shadow side of that gift right. is that we run narratives out. We, something happens, A, here in this moment, and in a split second, we're 10 years down the road, and right. we've created this gigantic, gigantic, awful, terrible Catastrophe. thing. Catastrophe. <laughs> and then our whole body, because it's hearing fear, right. it's hearing danger, goes into an adrenal uproar, yeah. and that's when all the physiological stuff yeah. happens. Yeah. But the psychological and emotional stuff that happens, which actually interests me a little more, God knows yeah. I'm not a biologist, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and how that inhibits our ability to be creative, to be present, mm -hmm. to open our hearts to each other, to cooperate, and his big purpose is to say, you know, there's enormous opportunity for you, for this global world that's emerging. Yeah. Gives you incredible opportunity to cooperate and yeah. collaborate. And the only thing that's really in the middle there and inhibits us are these narratives of fear yeah. and danger. And then if you <clears throat> extrapolate out that's on the individual level, but certainly our country is in the thick of it right yep. now. Yep. And it's, it has been in the past too, but it's so blatantly outrageous yeah. that it, it, it overshoots. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us feel that that's, these narratives are so crazy, there's no way. Mm -hmm. But there is, based on fear, actions being taken. Yep. It's interesting that you say actions being taken in the passive voice, because we can't even tell who's acting. Right. <laughs> right. Know, just... And what their <clears throat> real agenda is, is and what, you know, what the thinking right. is. Right. So recently, um, you gave a talk at Bard mm -hmm. College, mm -hmm. and you spoke about courage. Yeah. Uh, let me just quickly read this beautiful paragraph. Courage is an affair of both heart and mind. Americans, especially perhaps American intellectuals, are pretty skillful at the mind part. But we are not skillful at all at the heart part. Courage can seem heroic and may well be, but courage is more likely to flow from our deep connections with and commitments to each other. In a culture marked by alienation, competitiveness, and loneliness, living with courage can seem impossible. But it surely isn't. It is a natural outcome of life lived with depth and integrity. Such a beautiful paragraph. Thank you. And what I was thinking about was, here's fear on one hand, mm -hmm. and when fear is the first kind, you know, mm -hmm. the tiger in mm -hmm. the grass, it, it elicits courage yep. from within. Mm -hmm. And when it's the second kind from these crazy narratives that we create or the government creates or whatever, mm -hmm. there can't be courage. We get shut down. Yep. And can I go off a little bit on a side track there? Because we're missing one piece of the argument. Yeah. And that's capitalism. Okay, <laughs> we have sure. To, we have to put that in there. Because the reason that that person can't respond to that um, imagined fear is that that person feels isolated and alienated and alone. And that comes out of the capitalist market. Yeah. And that we are stripped we, each human being in this capitalist world yeah. is stripped of so much of our personness, our yeah. personhood, uh, in order to make us um, available to the labor market and to the consumption market. Yeah. And so we have lost our um, species connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to mm -hmm. make up a horrible phrase. So with the, the kids at Bard, yeah. what, I, what I had them 
do was to visualize um, the circle of care. In other words, the circle of people who care for them, each mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. and then the circle of people that they care for. Yeah. Because that's the antidote to the isolation and the loneliness right. and the powerlessness that capitalism and this postmodern society that goes along with it yeah. has created. If you stop and think about it, in whose interest is it that we are not able to connect with each other? It, the answer comes up pretty fast. Sure. You know, it's not in our interest. <laughs> it's certainly not in our interest, and it's not in the interest of our local communities and our families yeah. and our groups of friends. It's in the interest of people with power. Yeah. Um, I know you've talked with Frances Crow, and her favorite word is resist, resist, resist. Yeah. But it's not a violent resistance because she's talking about resist with compassion. Yeah. So that you hold off that structure of alienation mm -hmm. and force and fear in order to allow the flow of compassion, the flow yeah. of kindness, the flow of care yeah. um, to do its natural thing. We're, we're not fundamentally mean bastards, right. you know. <laughs> we're fundamentally relational. We're wired to relate. Yeah. We're wired to take care of each other. And so we need to extract ourselves from those structures mm -hmm. we've created mm -hmm. that prevent us from living out our full humanness. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I have this image in my head. It's, <laughs> it's of a film that I adore called um, uh, As It Is in Heaven. It's a Swedish film. And there is this moment where a woman who is in a domestic violence relationship with her husband is in this choir, their church choir. And he comes into the room and everyone knows he's, you know, he's out to hurt her. Mm -hmm. And they pull her in and surround mm -hmm. her. These are not like strong, macho people. They're women, young in children a choir. in a church <laughs> choir, but they hold her within them. Mm. And in a way, I, I, that's the image yeah, that came. Perfect. That the, It's not just, oh, aren't we sweet? We're going to have mm -hmm. connection. It's that that does have a power to it. Yep. It's a yeah. wonderful image. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, there is so much, and I'm looking to see. We have about five minutes. So I want to move on, but for now, and then we'll do that in the second part. There's one more word, and we're talking about it, you know, metaphorically or whatever, but the word interdependence. Yeah. Um, so... That's his word. Yeah. It's the classic Buddhist word. I wish I knew a, at least one word of Sanskrit. This would be the word I'd want to know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. And it, the, the way the Tibetans use the word interdependence is actually a fairly high-level philosophical theory about that none of us exists by ourselves. None of us can create our can create ourselves, none of us can create our own being, mm -hmm, that we are mm -hmm. all interdependent, and Thich Nhat Hanh is, yeah. is so fabulous at, yeah. at talking about how, you know, the whole world is in his teacup, right. you know, it's so sweet and, you see and powerful. Oh, and I deep. love that. Yeah. Yeah. I like using the word interrelated, mm -hmm. that we, be, we are dependent on each other, there's no question about it, but we don't, American culture really doesn't like the word dependence. It's, mm -hmm. you know, there's still a lot of, a lot of cowboy in, in yeah. us. So interrelated works better for me in the sense that we are all connected. And, and one of the remarkable things about American culture in particular, even more so than European, I'm not going to say it's Western mm -hmm. civilization, it's much more American than it is anywhere else I've ever been in the world, yeah. is this thing about doing it myself, I'll mm -hmm. do it my way, that mm -hmm. awful Frank Sinatra song. <laughs> 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 because we don't do anything 
our own mm. way. That's a fantasy. Yeah. And that feeds ego's mm -hmm. um, claim to centrality wow. and authority and power. Absolutely. And the truth is, we do everything together. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're already teaching me some things about this book, which I have read at least 10,000 times. Oh, my gosh. And that's because we're having a conversation. Sure. That, yeah. to me, is the core experience mm -hmm. of interrelatedness, of interconnection. Yeah, and it's a this is it's a sim, this is a simple example of yeah. it, but it's deep and potent. Absolutely, absolutely. And we live in a culture that denies it, <laughs> and yeah. we suffer from it. There, most ills of American society go back to that. Yeah. Yeah. So after our break, we should talk a little bit about local. Okay. Oh, well, and we have to talk kind of a lot. <laughs> about this particular time. Yes. And in a way, that's the timing of this interview is related mm -hmm. to what can, what can we do to help ease the fear yeah. and protect each other. Yeah. And, well, thank you for joining us. I'm Marcy Sklove. This is Going Deeper. I'm here with Penny Gill, and we'll be back in part two. Thank you.